Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, everyone. Welcome back to Quran 30 for 30. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulullah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. We have Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, uh, Yaqeen's finest, West Philadelphia's finest, Medina's finest, and Dr. Tahir Wayyad, Hafidahullah Ta'ala, uh, with us today. Uh, mashallah, you know, a clip went viral last year, Sheikh. Um, I, I don't know if you, I don't know if you knew that or not because you're not on social media, but, but there was a clip. I heard about it. You heard about it. Okay. Just making sure you heard about it. All right. Uh, but in, in uh, full seriousness, subhanAllah, we were in Umrah together, the three of us, a week ago. We were in Medina together a week ago, subhanAllah, sitting wow. together. And um, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to join us all uh, in, in the best of places on this earth, in the best of deeds, until we have the best of eternities uh, in, in the best companionship. It's really beautiful to be able to, to come back together and to, to speak um, and to reflect on the Qur'an together. Uh, the advices that I got from Sheikh Tahir um, have formed basically all my khawatir for Ramadan. So I'm like, good, just from uh, from Umrah, mashallah. <clears throat> and Sheikh Abdullah, Sheikh Tahir, Sheikh Abdullah missed Umrah so much, he tried to bring back the Kaaba. <laughs> put it on the wall behind him. This is the new setup all of a sudden. Yeah, it's on a roll today, man. <laughs> but, <laughs> Sheikh Abdullah, you're gonna you're gonna get us started. You 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 had you said you wanted the privilege of of, of uh, introducing. Uh, of course, of course. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, Sheikh Tar, you're from West Philadelphia, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, I th I think you'll probably be able to answer this question. Um, most likely, inshallah. <clears throat> you can call it the hot seat, the cold seat. I know it's cold in Philadelphia. I, all, I, all I can say is it feels like a setup. That's that's all I'm saying. <laughs> this is a segue. <clears throat> mm. How would you find Will Smith in the snow? Oh, he, he just hit me with a dad joke. So, so true story. You, you want me to tell you how? No. From the Fresh Prince. <laughs> So listen, I know you wanted to get me on that one, but we have a security guard here at the masjid who tells dad <laughs> jokes for a living. Mashallah. My man, I got to meet him. And that's one of the ones that he reruns every about every two months. Oh, so I memorized man. that one, mashallah. But what's the answer, Chef? What's the answer? That's I said it. it. I said it. You, you you know him from the Fresh Prince, but you know, it's a play the on footprints in the, the snow. Footprints the in the snow. Okay, the fresh prints. Oh. Got it. All right, oh, all right. Got it. The fresh oh, prints. Ah, uh, 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 I'm still so a little they, foggy from all I'm about to say, but Mumkin to Jed did a little do it. Wake up. The fresh prints. There you go. There you go. I got it. Okay. All right. Sheikh Abdullah didn't, he didn't have proper tajweed on. Oh, no. Oh, no. Excuses. Excuses. He's just yelling from it. This was a good dad joke that was used even in Philadelphia. Yes. That's how good it was. It's used here. I'm in West Philadelphia right now, by the way. It's not just that I'm from West Philadelphia. Well, look, if it gets rough in West Philadelphia, I believe you have an uncle that lives here in suburbs in Texas. Judge. Philip, what's, what's his name? No, we should, we should. <laughs> Valeria, yeah, Sheikh, not, 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 oh, okay. not, 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 Alhamdulillah. Uh, we've got, we've got, like, honestly speaking, we were reflecting before uh, starting today, we've got, mashallah, I think, uh, a really uh, special episode in the night uh, tonight, reflecting on this, this powerful juz, which is the first transition you're going to see from a surah to a surah, mm. al-Baqarah to Ali Imran. And inshallah, Sheikh Abdullah will actually start us off uh, tonight with the night time. Tafadl Sheikh Abdullah. Jazakumullah khairan. Bismillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala amma ba'du. As we know, the theme of this year, mashallah, tabarakallah, fourth season is the Quranic worldview and how we view ourselves. And what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in regards to that uh, and how we should live our lives, fulfilling our per ultimate purpose of worshiping him, subhanahu. There is one fundamental uh, milestone of our religion, which is believing in the fact that we will be resurrected, <clears throat> that all of us will go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that as he has created us in the beginning, nu'idu, wa'dan alayna, that he will return us to him, inshallah, and it's a promise from him. <clears throat> so understanding that there will be a day that all of us will return back, return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should cause the Muslim 
to think and to ponder, number one, on what they are doing in this life. And that number two, it is temporary. But within this life, remembering the day of resurrection, remembering that there will be a day that you will go back to him should serve as a motivation, a reminder, and a motivation for you to follow the Sharia, to do the best that you can. And this is what differentiates the person that believes in the one God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, believing in the message of the Quran, which motivates them to follow the deen of Islam. This is why it's important as well as the Muslim, when they take advice or listen to someone, that that individual has those same general interests in mind and at hand. Because sometimes we may be motivated, motivated by those that don't have that in the back of their mind, their subconscious mind, and hopefully in their conscious mind that they will go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're going to return to him and they will be asked about their deeds. This is why Allah has brought the Sharia, the deen of Islam, as a form of nourishment of the fitrah. Literally, Sharia means that which is water channels that come to a water hole, which further nourishes the individual. Being that when one practices this faith, they understand the reality of life, the purpose of life, therefore living out the Quranic worldview. This is what happened with Ibrahim alayhi salam <clears throat> in the chapter of Baqarah uh, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the introduction. When Ibrahim was in a, dare we say, a debate with the, uh, who some scholars say was Nimrud, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ibrahim fi rabbihi an mulk. Do you not see the one that Hajj Ibrahim, that tried to argue or dispute with Ibrahim in his Lord, or concerning his Lord, and that Allah gave him the mulk, the, the kingship. And Nimrud was known to be a king at that time, was said to be a king at that time. But what happened was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned Ibrahim said to him, If Kala Ibrahim Mulladi, if Kala Ibrahim Rabbi Aladi Yuhi wa umit, Kala an Uhi wa umit. Ibrahim said to him that my Lord is the one that gives life and causes death. But then Nimrud said, Ana Uhi wa umit that I am the one that gives life and causes death. Now, there's many understandings in regards to this, but I wanted to use this as an introduction to show the thabat of Ibrahim in his Lord, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that causes life, brings all, every single thing into, into life, gives it life, and also causes it to leave this earth, causes it to die, human beings and otherwise. This is important because when we look at other verses, the, the couple of verses that follow, where Ibrahim alayhi salam, after speaking with Nimrod and Nimrud and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, blessed him, Ibrahim alayhi salam, to overpower Nimrud with the arguments that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is able to come with the sun, yet to be shams min al mashriq fat to be him in al maghrib. He told him, okay, if you are such the one that can bring things to life and cause them to die, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that caused the sun to come from the east. You cause the sun to come from the west. And the ones that disbelieved, Nimrud, were overpowered. And they lost in that particular debate. <clears throat> but two verses later, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about Ibrahim and a question that Ibrahim asks. And this may happen with all of us. Where Ibrahim alayhi salam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, If ta'udhu billah Ibrahim rabbi, rabbi arini kayfa tuhyil mawta Ibrahim. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says, and when Ibrahim said, or mentioned when Ibrahim said, Oh my Lord, show me how you bring the dead to life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this verse. And it's important for us to know that Ibrahim, he believed in the qadiyah and he also believed in the kafiyah. That he believed in the qadiyah. He believed in the situation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, without a doubt, brings brought us into this earth and takes us away it's important for us to know that everything in this life what we see are manifestations of the creation of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being that allah is al khaliq al razik al mudabbir he is the creator he is a sustainer and maintainer within all of that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can cause it to stop at, at any moment and that is why he is the ultimate repository he is the source of all of these things therefore he is the one that brings things into existence and takes it out of existence. So when Ibrahim asked him, he was asking because he just wanted to know. It wasn't, oh Allah, I don't believe, show me, therefore I may believe. As we mentioned in the earlier verse, this is why we use that as an introduction to show that he believed that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in control of everything. 
and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that has power over everything and has ultimate influence over all of his creation because he is the creator. So he said, Kayfa tuhi al He asked him, Kayfa tuhi al Asking this question is similar to what Musa alayhi salam asked. Rabbi arini anzur ilayk. When Moses asked, oh Allah, show me, I want to see you. Qala lan tarani. Allah said, you will never see me. But this curiosity and this shawq, if you will, this desire to see their Lord, the one that they know brought them into existence and gave this, gave them this magnificent risala, this message. Ibrahim alayhi salam asked this question, not expressing any sort of doubt. It was more of him wanting to move from the ilm al yaqeen to ayn al yaqeen. As we know, the scholars mentioned there's three types of certainty of yaqeen. That of having knowledge of certainty, which inshallah all of us have now with Islam and even with this story. We have the knowledge that we are certain that this took place. And this yaqeen is very important in regards to the Quran. But Ibrahim wanted to move from ayn al yaqeen to ayn al yaqeen. He wanted to see. He wanted to see this, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings the dead to life, brings the life to the dead. <clears throat> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala further says after that, Awalam tu'min, will you not do will you not further believe? This is not to show that Ibrahim does not believe, or that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not is showing that he didn't believe and he needs this as a condition to believe. Ibrahim further says, And this is important. Ibrahim says, uh, no, Allah, of course I believe. Bala. Of course I believe, but I want my heart to feel at ease. Not to show that his heart was not at ease because he did not see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But this is a very important principle in regards to the Quranic worldview and the Islamic worldview. As they say, The more proofs that you have in anything in life, it will increase the ease in your heart. We were just in Umrah, for example. Have any of you, when you went to Umrah, you stood on Jabal al -Ruma? You went and you stand on the mountain of the archers, the one, the 40 that came down. When someone is telling you this story and you're standing on the mountain, it increases your shok, it increases that desire, therefore bringing more ease and tranquility with the whole story of the battle of Uhud. It doesn't mean that you didn't believe in it before. You had full certainty in it. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about it, it Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about when you implored and called out to your Lord and he answered your call and he sent the angels, 1,000 of them, one after the other. Allah does not have to mention that he sent angels. We ultimately know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to help, but he does that to bring ease to the heart. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala concludes here showing and proving to all of us that he is able to bring the dead to life and vice versa. When he says, when he orders Ibrahim alayhi salam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, take four different birds and hold them. And what's interesting here, when Allah said four, we don't want to go into why he said four and didn't say 16. Some scholars mentioned that he mentioned four different types of birds to show that this can happen with all birds, rather all of creation. Hold them close so you can encounter and see how they are because what is about to happen, there will be no other excuse. And take them, slaughter these, these birds and take these pieces and put them on different mountains. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Thummaj, He says, Thumma Then summon them, those pieces that are on the mountains, summon them. They will come back to you. Some scholars say flying because that is their way of sa'i. That is their way of hastiness, that they will come back to you. Wa'lam anna azizun hakim. And know that Allah is the almighty, the all-wise. As some scholars say, when it comes to al-izzah, la rada liman arad, lima arad. That there is nothing that will take him away or deny Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from what he wants. This is important, brothers and sisters, when looking at what is called the ba'ath and the resurrection, that it is a pillar of our faith and the Quranic worldview hones in on this, particularly around eight verses in the Quran that speak about the importance that we will go back to him. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. That we're, verily we are for Allah and to him we will return. And this should serve as a motivation in Ramadan and outside of Ramadan for us to ponder and think of what are we doing this life, doing in this life, because we don't know when we will return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
Barakallahu feekum. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh Abdul. SubhanAllah, powerful points. I think, SubhanAllah, what you mentioned, especially of, look, many Israel, no matter what Allah showed them, they were still going to disbelieve because the hearts were twisted, right? Yeah. Whereas the prophets and the righteous were going to believe and do exactly as they are commanded. But this is a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so, as you mentioned, Allah is giving Ibrahim Islam this gift is like when he gave the angels in Badr, as the scholars mentioned, Allah could have done so without sending the angels. Allah is could have simply uh, wiped away the army, but to give them that reinforcement, to give them that tranquility, that strength uh, was a gift uh, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Zakallah khair, Sheikh. Beautiful reflection, Sheikh Tahir, Tadl Dr. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala ma ba'd. Uh, those points were really important, and I'd like to uh, transition, as uh, Sheikh Omar mentioned at the very beginning, uh, that we're transitioning from Surah Al-Baqarah into uh, Surah Ali Imran. And the end of Surah Al-Baqarah is extremely profound. Those last two ayahs, the Prophet Alayhi Salatu Wasalam said, Man qara'a bi uh, al-ayatayn fi akhiri Surah Al-Baqarah fi laylatin kafatah. Whoever reads the last two ayahs uh, from Surah Al-Baqarah in a night, uh, then they will suffice him. Scholars have different interpretations of what it means that they will suffice him. As Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala mentioned that they will protect him from every uh, evil that would harm him. And so we think about these, these last ayahs from Surah Al-Baqarah. They begin, these last two ayahs, the Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala, he actually has a section in his fatawa. Uh, dedicated to the tafsir of uh, these two eyes. And it's, it's rather lengthy, I mean, to the tune of 20 pages or so. And he mentions uh, that they are a summary of the entirety of Surah Al-Baqarah. They begin with the articles of faith, just as we find in the beginning of Surah Al-Baqarah and also in the middle of Surah Al-Baqarah. And so Allah Azza wa is, in fact, mentioning and, and wit bearing witness that not only does the Prophet وسلم, believe in Allah, believe in the angels, believe in the books and believe in the messengers, but also the believers, the, the mu'minun, those who are following the Prophet وسلم, they also believe in these articles of faith. The articles of faith are not just something that a person can say is enough to have in their heart. The, those articles are going to manifest uh, in a person's actions. And this is where we get so the believers, this is their attitude towards the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to his injunctions in general, is that they say we hear, that is that we understand what is being said, that we are complying with what is being said, and we also obey. So we understood the command and we obey the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is obviously... Uh, easier said than done, our human frailty uh, dictates that we're going to have some shortcomings. What is our attitude towards those shortcomings that we have in fulfilling our iman and fulfilling the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? It's ufranak, right? Your Lord, uh, or afwan, your forgiveness, our Lord, right? Ufranaka rabbana wa ilayka al-masir. And then acknowledging that we are going to return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we're going to be held accountable for the things that, that we have failed to do uh, in terms of fulfilling the obligations or those things that we have done to uh, displease Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so this is why we're asking Allah Azza wa Jal right there, Wufranak, your forgiveness, O Allah. Um, and, and there's a, a, a rhetorical beauty to, to that statement that we don't have a chance to go into right now. But this transitions into the, the main theme uh, here, uh, when we talk about the Quranic worldview, which is لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not burden a soul beyond its capacity. Uh, some uh, some of the Mufassirin mentioned that this is even as it relates to the things that have been decreed uh, for a person, the difficulties, the trials that they go through, that Allah Azza wa Jal never tries someone with more than they have the capacity to deal with. And somebody may be tried with something that is outside of the capacity of someone else, but everything that you are tested with, you have the ability to deal with, with your trust on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That being said, the majority of the Mufassirin 
uh, the scholars of tafsir, when they talk about this ayat, they say that it is referring to the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Allah has not commanded us with anything that is beyond our scope. Uh, the basic rules of Islam, uh, for example, prayer five times a day, everybody has the ability to do that. It may be more difficult for some people than others, but everybody has the ability to do the bare minimums. The fasting of Ramadan, everybody has the ability to do that. Those who do not have the ability to do that for health reasons, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has excused them and he is not holding them accountable for what is beyond their capacity. Everybody, in theory, the Muslims, we have the ability to make hajj. For those who do not have the ability, whether it is financial or physical, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not hold them to account for that. And this is where the broad rule, or or there's another sub-rule of Islam, uh, or or in the what they call the qawaid al-fiqiyya, which is إِذَا ضَاقَ الْأَمْرُ اِتَّسَعَ Right? When things become tight, it relaxes. Well, what does that mean? It means that when uh, things become difficult for a person to do, for the person that is charged with a particular duty, right? Then the sharia becomes relaxed. So if a person can't stand in prayer like they're supposed to, then they're able to sit down and so on and so forth. Uh, again, this would be well beyond the scope of what we could talk about today. But the point is that we as Muslims really do have to take a step back and say, Alhamdulillah, that the deen is easy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants ease for us. He doesn't want difficulty. And, and in fact, uh, there is a level of difficulty associated with any level of success. I mean, the difficulty that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala charges us with from in a religious capacity uh, is no more than the things that we'd be willing to do in our dunya capacity. Uh, we wake up for Salat al-Fajr early. If your job was at five o'clock in the morning, you would get up at five o'clock in the morning for your job. It's it's within our capacity to do so. The travel to Hajj, people take vacations and they travel all over the world and they spend tons of money more than they would on Hajj. And so, again, the, the idea is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not burdening us with anything that is outside of our capacity. I, I want to say here, subhanAllah, uh, with, without, and, and I know my time is going to be up very soon, but I, I think that there are some important points here. I, I think about the man who came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi and he said to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that the rules and regulations, the sharia, just all the things that you can do in Islam, right, that they become so many. Like, get, just give me something comprehensive that I can do. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam keep your tongue moist with the remembrance of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala. Now, do those bare minimums that you have to do, uh, perhaps increase in some of the other acts of ibadah, but keep your tongue wet with the remembrance of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala because Islam is simply not difficult. Uh, Sheikh Abdullah will remember this less than a week ago. Uh, we were sitting with uh, one of our sheikhs from Medina in Mecca. And he said, he says something profound and it just ties into the to the capacity thing. He said, No, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not guide you to Islam, except that He wants you to enter into Jannah. He wants you to enter into He didn't guide you to Islam so that you could be from the people of the fire. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided you to Islam so that you would be from the people of Jannah. But we just have to be like those believers who say, Sama'na wa ta'na. We hear and we obey. And when we fall short in our obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his maghfirah, for his forgiveness, and reminding ourselves that we are going to return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, quickly, uh, just, to, just to wrap this up, at the end, this part of the dua, a lot of people read this, um, th these ayat uh, and, and don't really uh, distinguish between wa'fu anna, waghfir lana, warhamna. And, and what those three mean. And there is some overlap, but when they are mentioned together, some of the scholars say that al-afu or pardoning is for what you fall short, your shortcomings and fulfilling your obligations. So afu is related to that. You're asking Allah to pardon you for your shortcomings and fulfilling your obligations, whether those are your obligations to him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, or to his creation, your family, your children, your parents, your spouse, and so on and so forth. Uh, al maghfira so when you say, and forgive us, okay, you're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is directly related to the sins that you may have committed or those things that you have done that are displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whereas mercy, ar-rahmah, 
is encompasses both, and it is that Allah Azawajal removes the the effects of uh, both your shortcomings and your obligations and the sins that you may have committed. It's just something to keep in mind as we do to double and ponder over the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These two eyes, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, whoever reads them in the night, they will be sufficient for him. Ali ibn Abi Talib, radiallahu ta'ala, and who said, I don't think that there's anyone who understands Islam. I don't think there's, there's anyone who understands Islam that goes to sleep without reciting these two eyes. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to make us for most the people of the Quran and the people who keep the Quran on their tongues, Wallahu Alaikum. Ameen. Ameen. Jazakallah khair. Really, really uh, deep words, alhamdulillah, to ponder on. So I think if there's one habit, you know, Ramadan is a time of habit formation, a habit that you can take from this bit night time that you keep those last two verses from Surah Al Baqarah every night before you sleep. Even if you forget much of the other athkar, uh, don't forget those two. Barakallah fikum. I'm going to keep my section uh, a little shorter, inshallah ta'ala, but um, it builds on what Sheikh Taha just spoke about. So we're in just three, right? And we're talking about the connection now between Al-Baqarah and Ali Amran. And so you have the end of Al-Baqarah going into the beginning of Ali Amran. So just a few things I want you to pay attention to, which are very beautiful. Uh, the beginning of Al-Baqarah, وَالَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِمَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْكَ وَمَا أُنزِلَ مِنْ قَبْلِكَ Those who believe in that which was revealed to you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and that which was revealed to those that came before you. And Allah just covered for us the rejection of a people upon whom the revelation of the Torah came, upon whom the revelation of Musa alayhi wa sallam came. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is praising the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for affirming that revelation. I think that's very powerful. This is the beginning of Al-Baqarah, the beginning of Ali Imran. نَزَّلَ عَلَيْكَ الْكِتَابُ بِالْحَقِّ مُصَدِّقًا لِمَا بَيْنِ يَدَيْهِ وَأَنزَلَ التَّوْرَاتَ وَالْإِنْجِيلِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala specifies that he has revealed to you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the book in truth, as a confirmation, part of it being a confirmation of that which came before, and he revealed the Torah and the Injil. So as believers, as followers of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we affirm his revelation, that is the one we are bound by. And we affirm the revelation of the prophets that came before, even if their own ummas rejected them. SubhanAllah. So you have affirmation of the previous revelation in the beginning of Al-Baqarah and in the beginning of Ali Imran. In Al-Baqarah, you have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala telling us the story of how a tree was beautified. Zayyana lahum uh, shaytan You know, uh, shaytan beautified the tree to Adam alayhi salam and Hawa and Eve, which ultimately cost them temporarily their place in Al-Jannah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talked about the temptation in Al-Jannah, in Al-Baqarah. In Ali Imran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Zuyyinadinnasihubbushahwatiminannisa'iwalbanim لِلَّذِينَ تَقَوْا عِنْدَ رَبِّهِمْ جَنَّاتٌ تَجْرِي مِنْ تَحْتِيَ الْأَنْهَارِ خَالِدِينَ فِيهَا وَأَزْوَاجٌ مُطَهَّرَةٌ وَرِضْوَانٌ مِنَ اللَّهِ وَاللَّهُ بَصِيرٌ بِالْعِبَادِ Verses 14 and 15. So in Baqarah, you have the temptation in Jannah. In Ali Imran, Allah says in verses 14 and 15, the enjoyment of the desires of this world, whether it be from women or children or the treasures of gold and silver or fine horses or cattle, or fertile land, all of that has been made appealing to people in this life. And they're not all inherently sinful, but they become sinful if they take you away from your obligations to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah says, ذَلِكَ مَتَاعُ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا Those are the pleasures of this worldly life. That's okay as long as they don't distract you. Just remember, وَاللَّهُ عِنْدَهُ حُسْنُ الْمَآبِ To Allah, the finest destination belongs. That destination we talked about in Al-Baqarah, where subhanAllah, the story of the human being starts in Jannah. You know, it's unbelievable, subhanAllah, even in Al-Baqarah, even in the way that our story is told in the Qur'an. You started there, how do you get back there, right? That's kind of your whole pursuit. And the Qur'an is going to give you this roadmap to how you get back to that destination, that final, finest destination, husn al-ma'ab. And Allah says, قُلْ أَوْنَبِّيُكُمْ بِخَيْرٍ مِنْ دَارِكُمْ Say, O Prophet, shall I inform you of what is better than all of this? And Allah says, for those who are mindful of their Lord, they will have Jannatun Tajri Min Tahtiyal Anhal. 
خاردين فيها وأزواج مطهرة. They will have uh, you know gardens beneath which rivers flow, uh, uh, spouses that are pure. They will stay there forever. And on top of all of that, لِضْوَانٌ مِنَ Allah, They have the pleasure of Allah. وَاللَّهُ بَصِيرٌ بِالْعِبَادِ And Allah is all seen of His servants. So subhanAllah, it's like everything that you could be tempted by in this dunya, there is something better that should be calling you to Al-Jannah, to that final and finest destination. So you see, again, temptation in Al-Baqarah that led Adam alayhi salam for a moment from Al-Jannah and then temptation in this dunya in Ali Imran that can distract us from Al-Jannah. And finally, uh, and this is the most profound part that, that I wanted to really uh, talk about uh, because it fits what Shaykh Tahar was talking about with the uh, dua, uh, the affirmation of belief and a dua that comes after a disease. A dua that comes after a disease. What do I mean by that? Al-Baqarah ends with, آمَنَ الرَّسُولُ بِمَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْهِ مِنْ رَبِّهِ وَالْمُؤْمِنُونَ Verily, the Messenger of Allah believes in what was revealed to him, as do the believers. Right? Fast forward to Ali Imran, just a few verses after, literally, page and a half after. وَالرَّاسِخُونَ فِي الْعِلْمِ يَقُولُونَ آمَنَّا بِهِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that those who are foremost in knowledge, they say, we believe. So the affirmation of the people of belief. And look at what happens here. In Al-Baqarah, after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells you about the disease that led some of the people of Musa al-Islam astray, Allah gives you a dua to make to protect yourself from those diseases of hypocrisy and deviation. So you have the disease, you have a dua. Look at Ali Imran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَمَّا فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ زَيْغٌ فَيَتَّبِعُونَ مَا تَشَابَهَ مِنْهُ بِتِغَاءَ الْفِتْنَةِ وَبِتِغَاءَ تَأْوِيلِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that people who have a zayg in their hearts, zayg is a twist, it's deviation, so you went off the straight path. So those that have a crookedness in their heart will try to make crooked the straight path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they'll start to twist and turn, make haram what is halal, halal what is haram, all to fit with their crookedness, not to fit with the straight path back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, back to the destination. So Allah azza wa jalla says that those people that have that crookedness in their heart, they're going to try to swim within the ambiguous and use the ambiguous to dilute the straight path and to deviate themselves and others from the straight path. And right after that, subhanAllah, what's the dua? رَبَّنَا لَا تُزِغْ قُلُوبَنَا بَعْدَ إِذْ هَدَيْتَنَا وَهَبْ لَنَا مِنْ لَدُنْكَ رَحْمَ إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ الْوَحَبْ O our Lord, do not let our hearts deviate after you've guided us to the straight path. So, أَمَّا لَذِينَ فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ زَيْغْ and رَبَّنَا لَا تُزِغْ قُلُوبَنَا so Allah mentions the disease of crooked hearts, then right away a dua that we should make to protect ourselves from our hearts becoming uh, crooked. And some of the narrations where Um Salama radiallahu ta'ala anha was asked, what is the most frequent dua of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? And she mentioned, Ya muqallib al-qulub, thabbit qalbi ala deenik, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa used to say, O turner of hearts, make my heart firm on your way. In some of the narrations, ثُمَّ قَرَأَ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ Then the Prophet ﷺ recited, رَبَّنَا لَا تُزِغْ قُلُوبَنَا بَعْدَ إِذْ هَدَيْتَنَا So, O oh Allah, do not let our hearts become deviated after you have guided us. Which shows you, subhanAllah, that you don't simply get guided one time and then you're good. And, and this is a profound you know, reflection I was just thinking about while Shaykh Tahir was speaking about that conversation. Uh, with their teacher, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserve him uh, in Mecca. Allah does not just simply guide you and you say, I'm done now. And Shaykh Tom talked about this on the very first night, that it's not like you think you arrived and then you're entitled. Hidayah is a lifelong strive. It's a lifelong strive. And the greatest fear of the believers is actually encompassed in the du'as that are being made here. Realize the du'as that are coming from the believers in these first three ajza are not du'as for worldly things. They're du'as for Allah to protect them from losing that precious guidance or for failing to live up to it or for a spiritual disease that would cause them to not be able to see it properly or a spiritual disease that would cause them to make crooked because their hearts are crooked. Like that's their fear. It's so precious. We don't want to lose this. We don't want to lose this. We don't want to lose this. And so it's probably I just thought it was very profound when you look at just two and just three. Uh, Al-Baqarah and Ali Imran, disease and then du'a, disease and then du'a. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from the diseases of the heart and uh, the things that take us away from him. 
And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us and to keep us firm. Ya muqallib al qulub, thabbit qulubana ala deenik. O turner of hearts, we ask you to make our hearts firm on your path. Allahumma ameen. Uh, inshallah ta'ala, I'd love to pass it back to the mashaykh if they wanted to share a final thought. And then we'll go ahead and close off uh, for the evening. Tafadlul uh, mashaykh. I'll, I'll jump in and then inshallah, Sheikh Abdullah uh, can, can follow, but I, I do think there was a point that you made about Isaiah, right? That the heart being twisted. And I mean, if you fast forward, Allah Azawajal says in the Quran, when they, it's basically like they wanted to be twisted. They wanted to be astray. You know how many people just say, let me just live my life. Like they want to be that way. They know what guidance is. Don't blame Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for, for your lack of guidance. That was their reward. That was the, the, the recompense, in fact, for them choosing a path of misguidance is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continued to allow them to be misguided, sent them astray. So it's, it's important to also, as believers, to constantly look at what are those things that would cause my heart to go astray, to cause me not to be guided. And one of those things subhanallah is not believing the first time like meaning what when you first hear something implement it try to put it into practice even if it's not something you think you can do at that time don't dismiss it don't just say that's ridiculous or no like put it on your to-do list if it's not something you can do right away right because allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes between a person and their heart or, or there's a barrier there between them and guidance. Why? Right? Because they didn't believe in it the first time. It's no guarantee that you're going to get multiple chances to get it right. Yes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out of his mercy has given many people multiple chances. I mean, just look at the people, the Sahaba, radiallahu ta'ala, in whom who accepted Islam later, but who rejected the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa in the beginning. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed them to, to, to come to Islam. Right after having rejected faith, but there's no guarantee, and that's from Allah Azza wa grace and His mercy and His fadl, and He gives that to whomever He wills. So it is important for us as believers to to make sure that we keep away those things that would negatively influence our hearts, to stay away from those kind of environments, to to lessen the amount of distraction and the amount of things that we consume, especially in the month of Ramadan, right? That would make our hearts turn astray. We ask Allah Subhanahu wa Taala for that. That's what lies with us to make us firm on the deen of Islam. I mean, yeah, and there's a this subhanAllah just mentioning that. Um, there's a beautiful verse. I remember Ibn Qayyim, he mentions it in his book, uh, The Shower of Good Utterances, or translated as um, uh, Invocations of God. He mentions the verse, Alay sallahu bi kafin abda. Like, is Allah not enough for, is Allah not enough for his servant? Mm. I mean, when we just think about that, is Islam enough for me? I don't need anything else. I don't turn to anything else. My mm -hmm. ultimate resort in it, in the beginning, middle and end is Islam. Is what does Islam have to say about this? And that is my main concern. Because once there is some other concerns at that level or the level of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it could be to the level of polytheism indirectly or directly, which can alter or something lesser than that, which could ultimately lead to the zayl, which could be zayl of polytheism as well or any type of other zayl of twisting and turning to the level to where we may try to justify that act of disobedience. And that's where it gets really, really tricky. And, and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for thabat because the thabat is to stay firm on something and not to just go with anything that is moving as they say in Arabic language. We're at time. We love having you on, man. We, we're going to officially extend an offer for you to be the third uh, co-host of Quran <laughs> on, on a regular basis. Barakallahu feekum wa jazakum Allah khaira. Barakallahu feekum wa karamakum Allah. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to reward everyone. SubhanAllah, that fa'idah, the benefit you mentioned, everyone who's taking notes, Surah As-Saf, فَلَمَّا uh, زَاغُوا أَزَاغَ اللَّهُ قُلُوبَهُمْ When they turned away, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala turned them away, when their, their, their hearts away as well. So something for us to keep in mind of the coherence of the Quran and that worldview and, and what happens to us. Barakallahu feekum. We'll see you all tomorrow, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.